Welcome back to Bites of Pi. Today we're going to cover Classes and Objects, Part 1. This is the introduction. What is a class? Until now, programs we've written are fairly simple. They've involved only one class and used one method, called main. We've used methods and objects like string and math, but we really haven't covered creating your own classes and methods. Let's start by defining a class. A class is a blueprint. It defines what a properties an object of that type has, its state, and what an object can do, its behavior. Now, there are two primary parts of this blueprint. The blueprint doesn't, you don't actually, like in a blueprint, you don't actually have a house made out of blueprint or a car made out of blueprint. You use blueprints to kind of plan how objects and things in our world are designed and the different characteristics about them. They aren't, they aren't the actual thing. I wouldn't actually go drive a, a blueprint around I wouldn't actually live inside of a blueprint. You know, I, I, I need to actually build the thing. It's just instructions. So what, when you write a class, that's really all it is, is writing instructions on how to build, how the computer can build an object. Now, there are two primary parts of the class, so of, of, of a class blueprint. It's the state. Uh, what we define the state, we can define what state an object is in by its variables. Here's a kind of a simple example to explain it. Two things that we can define for a, a car is its color and manufacturer. So if I had a car and I wanted to describe this car's state, I could have a blue car and it was made from you know Mitsubishi. Or I had a red car and it was made from Honda. We can use these, we could use strings to kind of represent these this state of it of a car object. So we could have two variables like uh, two string variables that would define the state. Now I can use other things like integers, like how round the diameter of the tires are, or whatever I want to do to declare what state it is. The second thing uh, about objects is what they do. Objects are really useless unless they can do something. Uh, we define the behavior of the method. Uh, essentially this is the functions or the methods that uh, are, in caps are in the class. So using the car example from previously, we could honk the horn or we could drive it down the street. Well, let's take a look at uh, some code here. Here's a very simple class of a car. Okay, uh, at the top, and they don't necessarily need to be at the top, but at the top here we are defining variables. We're defining a string called color, and we're defining a string manufacturer. Now, it could be they could be integers, they could be uh, objects, they could be other, they could be anything. I could have a, a, a say I had a wheel class. I could have four wheel class wheel, four wheel classes here. These tell what are in the, these variables uh, describe the state of the car. And then down here you see the methods. So I've got a, con a, con a constructor here for the car. It's a method. You can tell a method difference between a method and a, and a variable uh, with this parameters. You, all methods kind of have this open and close parentheses. That is an easy way to tell what a, uh, a method does. And usually they have uh, these uh, curly braces. So this is this tells what the car can do. I'm going to build a car and I'm going to set these values. And then when I call honk, I'm going to honk the horn. I'm going to tell it to do something. Okay. Now let's just kind of illustrate what the difference is between a class and an object. Like I said, a class is a blueprint. I'm not going to actually do something with this blueprint. It just tells me the dimensions of the car and what kind of car it's going to do and what features it has. I can't actually go and drive a car. The object is a physical instance of that blueprint. So when I encode, here's my instructions on how to build a car. In code, I'm telling the computer, hey, I want to build this car. So when I hit this first line, it's going to actually carve out some space in memory and build me a car. When I get to the second line, I'm going to build a red car. So you notice that this car is orange. I describe the state of this car, it's orange. And when I get to the second line, I'm building a red car. Now I've got a, a red car. And now I'm going to tell the orange car to do something. I'm going to tell it to honk its horn. And then beep, there it is. So again, I'm building a car and I have, uh, there's certain states about the car. And then I'm going to do something with the car. I could say, you know, something more fancy. I could drive it. I could, you know, pop a wheelie. You know, lots of different things I could do with it. Right now, my, my functions are very simple. Now I'm going to kind of go through what it looks like in memory. You notice at the beginning, I've defined, I've done an import of the, of the car. I 
that doesn't really do anything in memory. It just imports it into uh, that something it imports the blueprint in, so I know how to create cars. When I hit this first line here, when I hit this uh, first line, it's going to create a new car. So in memory, I've got a variable called my car, and it's pointing to the memory location of this chunk of memory. Again, it carves out this chunk of memory where I can store color and manufacture and a place for the functions car, car and honk. Then when I call the second line, it's going to create have, a, have another variable that points to this chunk of memory. This a memory is a memory address, and it's going to point to the, this this whole chunk. And notice, notice it's carving out a huge chunk. We uh, in memory, it's very similar to the first one, but they're completely different. Then I'm going to call the honk function, and it's going to go directly to my car's honk. It didn't go to your car's honk. It went specifically to my car's honk. So if there's something specific to the state of this car, it's going to come out in this method here. The scope of the variable means where that variable can be used in the program. In this example, a variable like manufacturer can be used in every method of the class. So you notice here, I've got this string, I've declared these two variables here, and I'm using manufacturer here in this function, and I'm using it here in this function. It doesn't die off when that, that curly brace ends. However, if I use the define if I define a variable like catchy phrase like this one, it can only be used inside this method. Notice I'm declaring it. It, it really depends on the way you declare your, your variable. Notice I'm declaring it right here in this in the print add statement. So once I hit this end curly brace, I it dies off. Whatever he, whatever was here now dies off. I can't use catchy phrase in this function because I've defined it here. If I've defined it here outside of any function inside the class, it's going to apply to every function in that class. And that's really what we mean by scope. The visibility modifier. When we talk, when we write a class, think that you're building it for someone else to use. So, just like we have, when someone else uses your class, they don't really care how you do it, just that it, they only care that it works. Now, one of the one of the classes you've been using all up to now is the string class. Let's take the the string function length that you've probably used many times over. You don't know how they calculate the the number of characters. You just know that there are that many characters in the string. So they could probably have a little munchkin in there, you know, counting up characters. You know, one, two, three. Let's give it twenty-seven. Yeah, that's it. You don't really care how they do it. You just know. You just care that they do it. Now notice, they probably don't have, in, a, in, the, in the actual Java string class, they probably don't have a munchkin counting it. But they probably have some member variables in that class that are made private. Something that you can't see. There's no way that you can access it. So if you went to string and said, you know, string a, a dot munchkin, or a dot m, it won't know because I've, I've made that member private. Private will... And it, Private will make sure that nobody who uses your class will see it. Only your class can use it. Now, we, we, we will expose functions like length using the public method. So I want, I want people using my string class to use the function length. I don't want them to use Munchkin because I may do something with him later. So I make him private. So these are the two keywords. There are actually three keywords, but right now we're only going to focus on private which makes sure that only things in only things in the function can only things in your class can use this and public anybody can use encapsulation hiding the working pieces of a class is in called encapsulation here you can see that by declaring manufacturing manufacturer variable private but creating a getter function we allow the user to get the state but they can't change it so say i'm making a car for honda I'm, I'm a, I'm a Honda uh, employee. I'm going to create this. I'm going to create Honda, and I'm going to set this manufacturer to Honda. I don't want somebody coming in and changing it to a Toyota. I don't want somebody coming in. So anybody using my car class cannot change manufacturer. I've made that string private. Nobody can access that. However, I want the person who's using my class to read what kind of manufacturer it is. I want them to get it. So I've got this getter function. You'll, what we see, you, you'll probably hear the term getters and setters. 
If I want the user to set it, I will create a function that will set the value. If I want the user to get the function, I will use a get value. So here you can see I'm, re I'm returning it uh, back to the user so they can actually get what the value is, but I'm preventing them from changing it. Now, uh, we'll get into that in the demo shortly. We can also use private to make methods only usable by, method, by other methods in the class. These private methods are called support methods. The public methods are the ones that everyone uses. So, like, say, for example, I'm, I'm going to create a, a function called drive that'll do a whole bunch of stuff. But in while I'm driving, I want to update the speedometer of how many miles I'm driving. I may call this function, I may want to call this function sp update speedometer maybe a couple times, or it does something common. Uh, I want to call it, but I don't want users to call it. I don't want somebody to fudge their speedometer I don't want to, or their odometer. I will make these things private so that somebody using my class cannot, cannot call this function directly. But you notice I can actually call it while it's still inside my, my uh, car class. Methods. Program execution for methods. Method declaration. This specifies code that will be called when a method is invoked. When a method is called, the flow of the program jumps to the code in the method and executes the method. When that method is complete, the flow returns back to the calling method. Now, I have a set, set of uh, code here, and we're going to try and trace through it so you can see how it jumps back and forth. Now, we talked, you probably have done magpie, and you notice there was a magpie class and a runner class. Well, the runner class, you, you, you'll see this com, common uh, design pattern in programs where one class is, does basically is the the administrator he tells the other classes what to do but the primary running of the of the program happens in this runner class they we've got helper classes here that are used by that runner class to keep it straight so here you can see I've got my main function here in the car runner I'm going to create a car create two cars I'm going to honk the horns and then when Bill asks me who made my car I'm going to get the manufacturer from my car and then tell him what my car, who, who made my car. Let's trace through that. So I'm going to hit the little uh, ladybug. Notice I've put a couple breakpoints here, and I've also put a breakpoint. You notice I've got both classes open. I put a breakpoint here at the honk function and at the manufacturer function. Okay. So when as we step through, we're going to be able to to see how how this works. So here I am, in my car. I'm going to create a new car. Well, now watch watch what happens when I do this. If I create a new car, it's actually going to go. Uh, let me step into it first. There are these functions up here. I won't go ahead and get into it, but note, note right now that I'm going to step into the selected thread. You noticed how when I did that, it jumped. It jumped to the actual car constructor. Here I am, and I'm going to step into that. I'm going to step over these functions. So I'm stepping into this line of code. I'm going to set the color. The color is orange so now I'm going to set this color is now orange the manufacturer I'm going to set to Honda notice I set the manufacturer to Honda and then I return and notice I return right back to where I called it now I've got once I leave this function now I have a, a variable my car and I have this memory carved out where the car has a color and a manufacturer I'm gonna do the same thing I'm gonna step over this this your car and it did this. It did the same thing. It called the function. It called the car uh, constructor, and it created another car in memory. But this this time, it's a red car. I'm going to honk the horn. So I'm going to step over that. Notice I went to the honk. I went right to the honk. And notice that I'm in this. Now that I'm in this class, it it moved the 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 actual flow of the program moved to the car class. Notice that I'm in the orange car class, not in the red one. I'm in the orange car class. I'm going to print out my color, print it out, and now it returns me back. Now your car is red, so when I go when I go into the honk function, it'll print out the red car, and you come back out. Now I'm going to step step through this. Bill asks who made your car. I'm going to get the manufacturer. Now notice 
when, when we're going to talk about this in the functions, we actually have a return value. Well, these these functions did nothing. They just all they did was just print stuff out to the screen. They didn't really return anything. They have a void return call. And we're talk we're going to talk about return type here soon. But notice my car is actually set. I'm I'm setting a string to the value of what manufacturer gets back. So when I run this, when I step past this, get manufacturer is returning a string and the string I'm returning is manufacturer when I come back out of that notice I now have a variable called manufacturer that has the manufacturer Honda and I print that out so the one thing I really want you to get from this is that every time you your, your program will run from top to bottom starting here and continuing and down when I hit these functions like the constructor or the or the honk function control will then move to the different class execute the code in that class then return back to where you left off okay now we'll go into the actual pieces of a method the method header starts the de method definition it, de it declares what the inputs and the outputs will be for that method so First off is the visibility modifier. It tells you whether whether the person using your class can use your function or whether it's if it's private only you can use that function. The return type will return back a value. Now, if it's like what we had with with honking the horn, maybe you don't want that function to return a value. In that that case, this thing would be void. Otherwise, it will be a, a primitive or an object that you're going to return back from the function. This is your output. There's only one output for every function. This is the name of your function or your method called calculate. And then here's a parameter list. This is what goes into your function. So every every method has a list of inputs and it'll output one final value. The method body, so this is a method header. The method body is everything that follows the method header. So starting with this curly brace, it goes all the way down, and I really, sh I think, and it'll end at this this end curly brace. Now this, as 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 fledgling programmers, you need to make sure that you keep track of all the uh, curly braces to make sure that you know I'm properly starting and ending a function. If you get lost with how many curly braces you have inside your function, it'll be hard to debug. Now, one thing I want to note is that the return type here matches the, re the return value here matches the return type here. So I can't say return. I'm 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 going to create this this string called hold. I'm calc I'm doing some sort of calculation here, and I'm setting hold to some sort of value, and then I'm going to return that value back to the user. This return type has to match what you're returning in your in your return statement. The return keyword stops the execution of the method. If the method header defines a return value, then this must be followed up with a value of that return type. Like we like we talked about here, if I if I say this function is going to return a string, I have it's a contract with with the person using it that I have to return a string. If I don't do this, if I don't put a return value, it won't compile. It'll continue to complain until it, until you actually return a string. Note, like I said, like we said earlier, if the return type is void, you don't need a return statement. You don't have to use it. You can use a value that is returned by the method. Notice, like like I had in the sample program, I'm actually saving the value that the calculate that the that the function is returning. So if I passed in a value, I want to save the value coming back out. Now, when I call the function, the parameter lists are copied into that into the variables in your parameter list. So notice the order really matters. If I call calculate function, the value one goes into the variable value one, the value two goes into the variable value two, three goes into value three, and then this string goes into the message uh, variable. So it's really it really makes a difference what order you specify your parameters when you call the function when you call the method. 
And lastly, we're going to the constructor. There's a couple things you need to remember out the, about the constructor. The constructor shares the same name as the class. So, like we have in this car in this car uh, class, I have a constructor car, and it's the same name as car. That has to be the same name. Now, uh, also need to notice that. it does not have a return type like I like we had earlier notice this has a return type of void this is a return type of void and this has a return type of string car doesn't have a return type so a constructor does not have a re have that return type usually the instance variables are initialized here usually when you start and create a new class you notice I'm initializing variables. So here, I allow the user to set the color of the car when they created it. So I'm setting this color equal to color. I'll go into. We can go. We'll go into this. The, the keyword this later. Uh, I would also notice that I'm hard coding in the the value Honda. I'm not allowing the user to change it. I'm all. I'm just hard coding this in. And lastly, you don't have to define a constructor in most cases. So while I I defined it here for this car. I could have just as well not set this up. This concludes Classes and Objects Part 1. Thanks.